بامور ذي الحبس بوراش نصبار ينزادو سمير سمير اني ذا نخدم توغاش امدا نحت بوستان ذي الحين اقلاغ ذي الهم استوحاش a grande ponte que une o Ocidente às sociedades árabes em convulsão nos anos 10 do século XXI continua, como sempre, sendo negra e viscosa. Das dez maiores reservas mundiais de petróleo, sete se encontram na extensa região islâmica que se estende pela Ásia e o norte da África. Arábia Saudita, Irã, Iraque, Kuwait, Emirados Árabes Unidos e Líbia detêm juntos 75% do petróleo do planeta, cerca de 800 bilhões de barris de petróleo. Para se ter uma ideia, o Brasil tem atualmente uma reserva de 14 bilhões de barris e num cálculo otimista poderá chegar a 30 bilhões com as recentes descobertas de petróleo na camada do pré-sal. Apenas 4% do volume sob o solo destas economias petroleiras. Os Estados Unidos são o país consumidor mais voraz de petróleo do mundo. Em 2007, ele produzia 5 dos 20 milhões de barris por dia necessários para manter sua economia funcionando. Ainda que comprem petróleo de vários países, inclusive o Canadá e a Venezuela, os americanos são cada vez mais dependentes das reservas do chamado Grande Oriente Médio. O milênio desta semana encerra a série de reflexões sobre as causas, as consequências e os desdobramentos de 11 de setembro de 2001, discutindo o papel do petróleo nas disputas do século XX. E também nestes dez anos que separam os atentados às torres gêmeas das rebeliões árabes atuais. Nosso entrevistado é o historiador da Universidade de Michigan, Juan Cole. Cole escreveu vários livros sobre o Oriente Médio e publicou recentemente Engaging the Muslim World, que ainda não chegou ao Brasil. How much oil has to do with the, the recent events that followed the uprisings in Northern Africa and in the Middle East, especially the NATO's intervention in Libya? Well, I think oil has been a driver of American policy towards the Middle East in a big way. It's friendship with Saudi Arabia, uh, the invasion of um, Kuwait in 1991 to push Saddam back out of Kuwait. That had a lot to do with not wanting one country to control both the petroleum of Iraq and Kuwait and so to become a superpower. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with policy towards Iran. Um, I, I don't think that petroleum is so important in the events of the Arab Spring. We have, we have to keep in mind that uh, Libya has one of the largest reserves. In Africa. In Africa. But it's relatively small in world terms. Mm -hmm. So um, Libya was producing about 1.7 million barrels a day. Mm -hmm. um, Saudi Arabia produces... But we're talking about reserves that as I read in your book, of, of four billion barrels. Right. The, the, Libya is, is, is not Im, unimportant to the very oil, important. oil markets, but it's not mm, as important as some other countries. And moreover, it had already been opened mm -hmm. to Western oil companies yes. because the sanctions that had been on Libya, which prevented uh, investment there, were from Europe and from the United States. Uh, in 1998, the Europeans mm -hmm. lifted their sanctions. In 2004, the Americans lifted theirs. And after that, the oil companies in Italy and Spain and in France and Britain all came and did billions of dollars of bids. I think there was a great fear in Western Europe that if Gaddafi crushed the reform movement, uh, that people would become radicalized, as had happened in Algeria after mm -hmm. 1991. And if Libya becomes radicalized, then Al-Qaeda can get a toehold there, and it will spill over into Italy and into France and so forth. So I think it was security concerns that drove the Western European intervention mainly. Is there any, any very strong fundamentalist force in Libya? There had not been. But the fear was that if Gaddafi crushes the reformers, he will drive them into radicalism. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's come back to the oil. Reading your book, it seems clear that uh, the U.S. engagement in this region has gone through different stages since the Second World War. I would ask you to follow with us a chronological point of view. Phase one, if I may say so. <laughs> um, during the Cold War, it was about to assure the Gulf Petroleum that the Gulf Petroleum should flow freely to Japan and Western Europe. Tell us about it, this moment. After World War II, of course, uh, the, the world gradually was divided into pro-Soviet and pro-American pieces. Uh, and um, the, the two powers were in a big chess game with one another. And one of the deficits that the United States and its allies faced was that uh, there was no source of energy for Western Europe and for Japan. The United States at that time, through most of the Cold War, was a major petroleum producer itself. Mm -hmm. But the United States wanted to guarantee Western Europe and Japan the petroleum, and so was gradually drawn in uh, to being a Middle Eastern power. And the U.S. made an early and long-standing alliance with Saudi Arabia, prim primarily because it is the world's largest um, petroleum exporter. But the United States ha was pretty active in the region during this period. As you point out in the book, it supported the coup d'etat in Iran in 1953. Uh, it, was, it supported the fraudulent elections in Lebanon that kept in power the pro-American leader Camille Chamoun in 1957. Backing the Ba'ath Party that overthrew the Iraqi nationalist General Qasim in 1963. So there was always intervention, that had been always interventions from the United States and its allies in, uh, in the governments. Yes, the United States uh, after World War II and in the course of the Cold War beca became a kind of empire. So uh, when the Iranian parliament, uh, which was democratically elected, uh, nationalized uh, petroleum and then elected uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, its prime minister, in 1951, uh, the United States uh, and, and Britain announced a boycott of uh, Iranian petroleum, and, and there was pressure coming from the major oil companies. Uh, uh, what is now British Petroleum, or BP, mm -hmm. was then the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. So that's where BP comes from. It was mm -hmm. the Iran. It, 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 ha it had the contract for Iranian petroleum, uh, and um, uh, the major U.S. companies also uh, were. Uh, uh, very angry at Iran's national attempt to nationalize its petroleum. And ultimately, the Americans sent in uh, uh, the CIA to w work with the uh, right-wing officers to make a coup in mm -hmm. uh, 1953. Uh, and as you say, there, there w was a covert uh, intervention in, uh, in, in Lebanon in 1957 to support a right-wing Christian uh, president. Um, against his internal enemies. But so yes, the United States has intervened in, in uh, the Middle East to try to shape it in powerful ways. Uh, in many instances, the United States also lost. You know, in the 1950s, it was wooing uh, the nationalist leader in Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, even intervened on Abdel Nasser's behalf in 1956 mm -hmm. and made the British and the French and the Israelis withdraw from Egypt. Uh, in hopes of winning, I think, uh, Abdel Nasser's friendship and uh, guaranteeing that Egypt did not go into the Soviet camp. But increasingly, there were tensions between the United States and Egypt, uh, and ultimately, in the 1960s, Egypt did become uh, an ally of the Soviet Union, and Premier Khrushchev visited in 1964. Uh, so a decade later, uh, Anwar Sadat then brought Egypt over to the American side. So, uh, you know, it went back and forth sometimes. Then we come to the 1970s crisis when uh, a new wave of nationalization by OPEC members took place. The withdrawal of the British troops by this time in the region made a sort of uh, vacuum of um, 
political security to the West in the region. What happened then? Yeah, well the British of course had been um, in charge of the Persian Gulf uh, since the 19th century and had shaped it powerfully. But Britain withdrew and decolonized uh, through the 60s and by 1971 uh, virtually all the countries in the Persian Gulf were independent. Many of them were small. They were emirates that had made uh, treaties with the British and had gotten naval protection from the British. Now there was no, no guarantor of their security. The United States at the time was not interested, I think, in becoming a major power in, in the Persian Gulf region. The Middle East was a secondary arena for the United States. It was much more interested in, in Central Europe, where of course American tanks and Soviet tanks were staring at one another between East and West Germany, and in Southeast Asia, where the U.S. was pursuing the Vietnam War. And the first thing that Nixon, uh, uh, Henry K uh, Kissinger and, and, and uh, Richard Nixon tried was to ask the Shah of Iran to guarantee the security of the Gulf. And the Shah actually sent troops at some point to Oman and was acting like a regional power um, and ordered a lot of Amer military equipment from the United States uh, to play that role. But in 1979, the Shah was overthrown by the Islamic Revolution and so that plan was destroyed. U.S. and its allies also stimulated the idea to transform uh, Saudi Arabia as, uh, to give Saudi, Saudi Arabia a sort of leadership, religion, re leadership yes. in, in, in the region. And um, could we say that those were the seeds of uh, the Islamic fundamentalism? I think it's one of the roots of it. Uh, the United States um, at, at several points during the Cold War tried to promote uh, uh, Islam. It's iron ironic now, but uh, that was the case then. So the Eisenhower administration provided funds to uh, uh, improve the railroads so that uh, pilgrims could come on pilgrimage to Mecca and Eisenhower wanted to build up the king of Saudi Arabia as, as, a, as not only as a secular uh, monarch but as, as a religious figure uh, that maybe would attract the uh, loyalty of Muslims throughout the world and the idea was that Islam, that religion, piety could uh, uh, combat uh, communism which of course uh, doesn't believe in religion uh, and, um, and moreover, Islamic law had a long tradition of supporting property rights and private property, so it could be deployed for you capitalist see. purposes. Mm -hmm. Billions of dollars in the 1980s were channeled to Muslim radicals uh, as long as they would fight the communists. Uh, so it is a kind of Pied Piper of Hamlin uh, story if, if you promote uh, right-wing Islam uh, long enough, then you'll have a lot of right-wing Muslim fundamentalists, some of whom may then turn against the West. So can we say then that a new phase started when the U.S. finally decided to explicit its, its uh, major military power in the region after the Gulf War? Yes. I think, you know, the, the attempt they, to find a proxy failed. They had two enemies. Yeah, yeah they, they, the, the they two first, allies had become two enemies. Yeah, first they tried Iran and that didn't work. Then they allied with Saddam Hussein in the 1980s, and then he invaded Kuwait and disappointed them. So by the early 90s, uh, there were no regional proxies that were uh, plausible to provide security in the Gulf, and the Gulf War was the announcement that the U.S. was now going to be the major power. But by 1991, the Soviet Union had fallen. So the real question, I think, in the Middle Eastern affairs after 91 was, who is going to provide security to the petroleum? And uh, the British had long gone, the, the Iranians had turned against the West, uh, Saddam Hussein had uh, come into conflict with the United States. So the U.S. Uh, in, in, uh, in 1991 uh, pushed Iraq out of Kuwait and thereafter just stayed in the region. It has bases in Kuwait, it has a base in Qatar, it has an, a major naval base which is the headquarters of the 5th Fleet in, in Manama and Bahrain. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. is a Gulf power now. But 
the recent intervention in Libya was left substantially to NATO's major powers, England and France, who actually had their feet in the region for a long time. Would this indicate, in a certain way, a new American trend to adopt a more distant and arbitral position? How much of this arbitral position has to do with the U.S. crisis today? Well, certainly the U.S. resources are uh, constrained. Uh, after the financial collapse of 2008, uh, the debt crisis, uh, the ongoing uh, expenses of wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and so I, I think uh, President Obama uh, cares about public opinion. He wants to be reelected re uh, for a second term. Uh, and I think for that reason was um, not happy about the idea of, of yet another war in the Middle East. Uh, and remember also that by this time that the Libya conflict broke out, uh, President Obama knew that it was very likely they had located Osama bin Laden. They might be able to take him out. They might be able to destroy Al-Qaeda more or less as an organization. But, uh, frankly, uh, what was the, which power had Osama bin Laden when he was killed? Um, Al-Qaeda didn't have the f political force it used to have. Well, that's true. That's true. I mean, Al-Qaeda was always exaggerated as a threat. Of course, killing 3,000 people in such a massive way uh, had made the reputation, but it was a s relatively small operation, cost half a million dollars. But what I'm saying is that Obama was reluctant to get involved in Libya because he knew politically that he had a, probably a great victory coming, and he didn't want to muddy the waters uh, with, with a quagmire in Libya because nobody knew if this thing would succeed. Uh, so yes, you're, you're right. Uh, the, uh, Obama's instincts are to play a multilateral game, uh, to, to only make policy initiatives if he can get allies aboard. And I think the uh, enthusiasm of uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and David Cameron for this Libya uh, venture, a, as well as the enthusiasm of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, I would key. Perhaps this new centering is facing a new geopolitical shift. Uh, there's a new race for nat natural resources, which involves new players in the game, the continental emerging countries. And two major oil consumers got into the picture, China and India. Both of them are heavily investing in Saudi Arabia and China is heavily investing in Iran, too. Would you say that we are entering a new and more complicated stage of dispute of influence in this area? Yes, because th th there aren't that many new fields being discovered of petroleum, and uh, over time the demand is rising more quickly than the supply. Uh, so it does mean that there will be geopolitical competition between the United States, China, India, uh, uh, the countries that aren't uh, big producers themselves uh, are, are looking for petroleum. How far are we from leaving from a post-carbon era? This change will come, you know, faster than we think. Uh, the 30 years uh, or 40 years certainly is, is the timeline. But the problem is that if you need to get to work tomorrow, that doesn't do you any good. Uh, and so if, if the petroleum supplies are uh, in doubt, uh, in, in the near future, it can cause conflict among countries. So far, China is not being um, militarily uh, assertive. Uh, the Chinese have a doctrine of harmonious development. They and do. They had not been imperialist in yeah. the term of, uh, right. in so the, the extreme uh, yeah. sense of the word. So, you know, they, they didn't oppose the American invasion of Iraq. They, they, they criticized it, but they didn't oppose it. And they, they, they allowed the intervention in Libya. They didn't vote against it at the UN. So the Chinese don't play that kind of aggressive role at the moment. Uh, at the moment, the United States is still, will? it's possible. It's possible that if the competition for petroleum becomes fiercer, because despite the Brazilian discoveries, uh, the amount of oil that needs to be discovered is not being discovered if we're going to continue to use it at this rate.
and, uh, and if, if the Chinese and the Indians all decide to have automobiles, we're in big trouble. Uh, so uh, the competition for this resource could come to the point of, of actually going to conflict. I would like to come back to the 2011 uprisings through Egypt, where you have lived for such a long time. And um, as you point out in your book, is the most popular Arab country among Americans, although Egyptian citizens give the U.S. the lowest favorability ratings in the world. How much power has the U.S. and its allies to intervene in a post Hosni Musbarak era uh, to keep government closely cooperating with them? Well, the Arab Spring is a big challenge to American policy in the Middle East. American policy in the Middle East had been dependent on support of Israel and support of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Uh, it sounds contradictory, but those are the two pillars. And um, Egypt was key because... Sounds, but it is not contradictory. It, it, in, in fact, it's not. But, so Egypt was key because it has a peace treaty with Israel and cooperated closely with Israel on security issues. And it, its army helped to guarantee the security of Saudi Arabia, the free flow of goods uh, through the, the Suez Canal, including about 10% of the world's petroleum goes through the Suez Canal. Uh, so uh, Egypt has been very important as yes. an American ally in, in supporting both of those pillars. And uh, the fall of the Mubarak government to a popular uprising uh, places in doubt that role of Egypt. And already uh, Egypt is showing independence from U.S. policy. So they announced they're going to open an embassy in Iran and also to have uh, uh, plane uh, flights by Egypt Air to Tehran. Uh, then they, um, they said that the Israeli blockade on the civilian population of Gaza is shameful. And they, they went some way towards opening the, the uh, border crossing at Rafah. Uh, and uh, the Saudis had so strongly supported Hosni Mubarak that their name is kind of mud in Cairo at the moment. I spent the summer in, in, in Egypt, uh, and uh, people were very critical of the role of Saudi Arabia. So Egypt has moved from being a very strong supporter of U.S. policy in the region to being much more lukewarm. And uh, the Americans and are the, afraid about this. As in Libya, is the opposite that is happening now. Yes. Well, uh, in, in, in Libya, um, uh, people have been very anti-American in places like Benghazi because especially after Gaddafi made friends with Bush and, uh, and, and so forth. But um, at the moment, uh, the United States is riding high in Libyan public opinion because uh, they, they helped to overthrow Gaddafi. And you see people waving American flags in, in Benghazi and Tripoli. Uh, this is quite remarkable. You know, I have been studying the Middle East uh, 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 since the 70s, and I have never seen an Arab wave an American flag. Uh, so uh, it's a big change. Thank you very much, Professor. You're very welcome. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you.